Thanks, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me first of all start off by uh, expressing my appreciation to our two uh, agency colleagues, uh, NSF, USDA, for joining us uh, to put this, uh, this workshop together. Uh, we had a very selfish reason why we wanted this workshop, which is what I'm going to talk about related to a round of strategic planning we're in the midst of, but it was really great to be able to uh, reach out to two other federal agencies who have uh, overlapping interests in this area and having uh, such a productive collaboration to put this on. Certainly appreciate um, the people who organized this and appreciate all of you for coming and, and now staying in, until through, through Friday afternoon um, before departing. Um, I, unfortunately, my schedule was a little crazy this week, um, and so I wasn't able to get here yesterday. I watched a little bit on our video feed, and I've, I've been hearing from various people, including some of the staff, that sounds like it's been an extremely robust discussion and great presentation, so I appreciate um, all of you who have participated. What I wanted to do is to, um, and, and looking out at the audience and looking at the roster of people who are here, um, there are, are a number of you who have not uh, been involved in any of the activities so far, to my knowledge, uh, related to NHGRI's current round of, of strategic planning. And so I was asked um, to come give a bit brief overview about this, but also we wanted then, I'll turn this over to Carolyn Hutter, who will help along with I think Jen and others to help sort of stimulate a discussion to get your feedback while we have a captive audience, because this is an area we are interested in and, and knowing what your thoughts are as it integrates with a very important part of NHGRI's future. Now, one thing to appreciate about NHGRI, maybe the whole field of genomics, but certainly NHGRI, is that we very much embrace the notion of strategic planning. Uh, we'd probably do it, in a, be honest with you, in a more robust fashion than any of the other 26 other institutes and centers at NIH. Um, I think the history of that relates to our origins, where we were created as a part of NIH to lead um, uh, the NIH's effort in the Human Genome Project, and we sort of just grew up um, as part of an international collaboration of the Human Genome Project, which was guided by a series of strategic plans. Three of those are shown here whereby there was this very comfortable feeling of engaging the community, getting their input on how do you actually do what you're trying to achieve, but recognizing that within a year or two, you're willing to rip that up and come up with a new approach as technologies advance and new opportunities arise. And we have just stuck to that kind of a style playbook to help frame um, our scientific uh, agenda. Um, when the Genome Project ended, literally the day the Genome Project ended, we published this strategic plan in 2003, which really guided us for the rest of that decade. And then in 2011, we published our most recent strategic plan, um, one that went beyond some of the fundamentals we had described um, at the end of the Human Genome Project um, and up and through 2010, but in particular expanded our research portfolio that included reaching out into clinical research and thinking about how to implement genomic medicine. And so this 2011 strategic plan um, sort of is organized around five major progressive research domains that start from the far left, understanding fundamentals of structure and function of genomes, in the middle more translational work to use genomics to understand human disease, of course an important priority at the National Institutes of Health, and then in the far and the, the, the rightward domains, thinking about how you can use genomics to advance medicine, eventually improve the effectiveness of healthcare. And this is sort of the centerpiece figure from our 2011 strategic plan. I can tell you we have almost every aspect of the institute um, organized around this strategic plan, um, and it has served us well, actually serves us extremely well, um, even up to the present time. Um, but in thinking about it, it was, you know, basically came out of strategic planning that took place mostly in 2009, 2010, it was really drafted in tw and mostly written in 2010 and then was published in 2011. And we just felt as we thought about the next decade that it was probably important uh, to not to stay too fixed to a strategic plan that at that point would be 10 years old. And we just thought it was important for us to start the new decade um, with uh, a, a new strategic plan. And so as a result of that, and having done this multiple times, we know we needed two plus years to accomplish this if we're going to do it well and engage and, and recognize that we were going to have to engage even more stakeholders than ever because our community has just grown and grown and grown, especially as we've moved from very basic genomics into more translational and clinical applications of genomics. 
So we really planned for this going back to 2017, and then in February 2018, we formally kicked off this new round of strategic planning, knowing it would take us two years. Sometime in 2020, we would publish it. We looked across 2020, said when would be a nice time to publish a new strategic plan, we like odometer moments. Um, and so we happened to pick October of 2020 because conveniently that'll be the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. Just seemed like a good time to publish it. If we're gonna publish this in October, it means we really have to submit the manuscript sometime over the summer. We need to have a good draft for feedback uh, to get lots of feedback from people by the spring. And so basically we've had this interval of time to try to think about all the different ways to get the input we want to write a strategic plan. And thinking about what were gonna be the elements we would use, we just reached into the toolkit we've used in previous rounds of strategic planning, but also grabbed some newer approaches. Um, and those are just listed here. We've now had, I think this engagement this afternoon probably is getting near number 40. If you're gonna add up all the ways we've gone to meetings or had workshops or had town halls or had special sessions or had webinars, et cetera, et cetera, I think our number is approaching 40. Um, and uh, this is just emblematic of the kind of things we've been doing both here in Bethesda, actually across the country, and actually we've even gone abroad and done at least one or a couple of these kinds of things as well. Um, and so all these things are going on. Um, we are past the halfway mark. We're probably about there in the process, you can see. We are certainly getting past the point where we're just hearing open-ended feedback, and we're be, we have certainly are now get very much into synthesizing what we're hearing. I think some of the things you're gonna hear we're gonna put up in front of you relate to some of the early synthesis. As you can see, we as we hone in on the spring of 2020 when we wanna have a draft uh, paper available for comment. But before I turn this over to Carolyn, there are two other nuances I think have really, I, in many ways, shaped many aspects. I guarantee you these nuances will shape the crafting of the actual strategic plan because the world is a different place now from our perspective with respect in, in, in genomics uh, than it was previously in ways that I'll describe. And so there's just two nuances I wanna introduce you to um, that I think are important for you to know. Uh, the first nuance, which if you're not geeky familiar with NIH, um, you may not quite appreciate, but it is important for me to remind you about this, is that uh, the NIH has 27 institutes and centers, and they are very different in size, is the thing to know. So here's NHGRI, and if proportional to the diameter of that circle, that is the size of our budget relative to the other 26. And you could quickly appreciate that while we all believe that genomics is incredibly important, and while genomics has this massive intellectual footprint, the National Human Genome Research Institute is a small institute at NIH relative to the other, most others. Uh, in fact, we account for about 1.5 percent of the NIH budget. So keep that in mind. Now, once upon a time, that was probably perfectly fine when genomics was young. Uh, and we were synonymous with genomics. But that's the other nuance I want to introduce you to, is there has been a remarkable, I think, successful dissemination of genomics across all of NIH, obviously across all of biology and all the life sciences, but if we're just honing in on the National Institutes of Health, genomics has been widely, widely, widely disseminated across the NIH. We think this is successful. We think this is what we should be doing, is getting others to be doing genomics. We should be enabling it. But it really does put us in a very different place now than we've been in the past. And let me give you real data so you can appreciate the scale at which the world has changed around us at NIH. So if you actually just search NIH databases for all the money we've given out or the money we spend on campus in our intramural program and you look at keywords like human genome and you simply ask the question, what is the percent of NIH awarded funds that carry a keyword like human genomic that comes from our institute? And look at that over different periods of time. I can tell you that during the Human Genome Project was a very easy number to keep track of because it was nearly 100 percent, it was over 95 percent. And even when the Genome Project ended and we published our 2003 strategic plan, it was still an easy number to keep track of, and HGRI was largely synonymous with genomics research at NIH. But starting 16 years ago, the world began to change around us because we were successful at getting other institutes to do genomics in very productive ways. So that by 2011, when our strategic plan came out, we'd actually dip below 50 percent, although still we were, with our one and a half percent of the NIH budget, we were still accounting for about 50 percent of genomics research, but that's just not the case anymore. In fact, by the time our 2020 strategic plan comes out, 
And as our estimate, right now we're at about 15%, accounting for 15% of genomics research. We think by the time our plan comes out, that number is going to be about 10%. So NHGRI, once upon a time, synonymous with genomics at NIH, almost 100% accounting for genomics research is now down to only about a tenth of genomics research at NIH. That trend has been remarkably um, um, important. We think it's the right trend. But at the same time, it changes our place in the universe as the way we think of it. And in fact, before we actually even embarked on our new round of strategic planning, recognizing that things were changing around us, that we felt it was really important to sort of re-identify ourselves. What is our role at NIH and in biomedicine and so forth? And we actually came up with a new mantra, and probably you've seen some of this on slides and so forth. But our strategic plan in 2020 is very much going to be a reflection of our view of what it is like to be at the forefront of genomics. We are not all of genomics. We're not even 20 percent of genomics. At NIH, we're only about 10 percent of genomics, but we are the forefront of genomics. And what we need to hear and what we're constantly asking is, when you're at the forefront of genomics, what does that mean? Because that's what we should be doing with the 10 percent of NIH money going to genomics research. So in summary, this strategic plan that you can look for in October of 2020 is going to be, we think, the driving force for much of genomics at NIH and around the world. We hope it'll provide clear, yes, 2020 vision for using genomics to advance human health. It's going to obviously guide our scientific priorities that will shape our research portfolio. It will also foster partnerships that are much wider and further than we've ever had before because our communities have gotten bigger, especially as we've begun to touch healthcare and, as, and, and, and make genomic medicine a reality such that now patients are part of our stakeholder group, not to mention policy groups and other general public communities. And of course, what's going to be most important about the strategic plan is it's going to really help us define what does it mean to be at the forefront of genomics. So lots of ways to engage with us, obviously websites and through email and through social media and so forth. Um, but that's the overview I wanted to provide you. And with that in mind, I'm going to turn this over to Carolyn Hutter, who I think is going to now drill down from this very high level that I described to what we would like to hear from you in the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or 30 minutes, something like that. So Carolyn. Thank you. 